stars in the dark A song that lights up the stars One breath that gives life The one sovereign in power Who speaks with thunder and fire One Lord, one King There is no other that can A message that's entitled Jesus Restores Our Lives is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. We'll read momentarily. But you know, if, if we are in Christ, we have become new creations. Now, as a body in Christ and as believers and people who are, are not scared of churchy terms, uh, those things uh, make sense to us that we are new creature, creatures and a new creation uh, in Christ. But, you know, we also know that when we come to Christ, we have to say goodbye to the old self. We have to say goodbye to Mr. Old Habits, and we have to say bye, goodbye to the passions and the practices of the past so that Jesus, who has restored our life, re we receive the newness of life, uh, the new man, so to speak, therefore new creations, and we are made in his image. Those things make sense to born-again believers, doesn't it? We understand those things. And yet, here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, we're given clear and precise instruction on what the new person in Christ should look like. Now, that's an everyday experience. That's every day for our lives from the point we become a Christian to now, as well as tomorrow and in the future. It's something we must refer back to to see if we are putting on the right garments that this scripture is challenging us to put on so that we're representing that image, that we're representing that creation, that we're representing everything God has given to each of us in new life. And so understanding that we're told how to live life, 
in Christ and that which has been restored and what it looks like as being restored individuals. A certain undeniable change has to take place for this scripture to come to life in our lives in Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 17. Let's read that. It says this in verse 12. Therefore, now obviously that word therefore is tying what has been previously said together with this passage. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion. These are the garments that we're to put on. Put on the heartfelt compassion, the kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against the other, another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of the Messiah to which you were called in one body control your hearts. Be thankful. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in our hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know, that's a powerful passage of Scripture. But for a new believer, it's very deep. It's very, it could be very confusing because it looks like we've got to do a certain thing in order to be a certain way. But understanding when Christ comes into our life, this passage, the Christian life, is an everyday experience in which you and I entangle ourselves with, with joy and with great anticipation as we put on the garments every day in our life based on that which is already within us that lives and has changed us. This change is not something we have done. It is something Christ has done for us and has done to us, in us, and through us. And as we read and study this passage, we need to remember that the Bible is not a book about people. The Bible is a book about God. Now, let that statement sink in. The Bible itself is not a a book about people. Now, there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of people inside the Scripture. But it is a book about God. You've got to remember that everything's being told to us in Scripture is pointing these people to God and God making the change and doing the work and doing the service, doing the ministry. It is God who is being uplifted. It is God who's, being, who's inhabiting the praise of his people. But we gain insight because we are the people. And so in this case, God deals with his people every day. Colossians chapter 3 is a passage of how Jesus restores our life and deals with us every day. So as we examine this text, let us remember that it's God who's always proactive. He's all, he always takes the initiative. And he took the initiative in salvation, and he takes the initiative in sanctification. And that's what we're talking about here in this passage. God always takes the initiative and then calls upon us to respond accordingly to that initiative. It's very important we understand that. Notice there are five areas where we, he has taken the initiative to restore us and then the response that he expects from us as those who have been restored into fellowship with him. And we're going to deal with those five issues. We're going to deal with the garments we put on. We're going to deal with two things as well that matters most inside this passage. There's a lot to unpack in these few verses. First of all, let's talk about the areas of restoration based on the Scripture. First of all, we see this. Because He chose us. Keep this in mind. Because He chose us, we're able to enjoy favor with God. And that's found in verse 12, the first part, God's God's chosen ones, holy and loved. Paul begins reminding us of the fact that God chose us, he's elected us, and therefore we enjoy the position that he has given us, which is very unique, who is in his favor. It is because of his choice he's allowed us to be a part of what he is. Because he's took the initiative. 
and we respond to that initiative. We're holy because of God's work in our life. We're set apart because of the Holy Spirit in our life. And the rest of the world and who understands the mindset of Christianity understands the mindset of being set apart for God. We are God's unique creation. We are His people. We're chosen to demonstrate His reality to the world in which we live. It is what God is going to do through you when you say yes to Him. And we enjoy that favor for the rest of our lives on into eternity. We were chosen to be different so that others can see the power and the glory of God. He restored us to demonstrate His power to the world around us. His Phillips translation says this, that because you are picked representatives of a new humanity, we are purified and beloved of God Himself. Now, what we're talking about is that now not only are we holy and set apart to God, we are beloved. In other words, we're loved by God. It means that God loves us and wants the very best for us. And the very best you'll find in His Word and passages like this in Colossians is one that just comes out at us to say to us, God is not bringing restrictions. He's bringing victory. He's bringing freedom. And he's allowing us to put on certain garments that will indicate that we are living in his image, that we are demonstrating who God is in our life. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, it says, The Lord was devoted to you and chose you, not because you were more numerous than all other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you. You, he chose you. And because God loves us, he counsels us to put off the old man, to take off that sinful way of life, and to put on the clothes that you and I need for everyday life that will cover ourselves as we become his representatives that he's chosen for us to be. In the same word used in Ephesians chapter 6, we are to put on the spiritual armor of God it is the same understanding that we're to put on certain garments that we live everyday life so that we can live a life not of war, but a life of peace, that we can live a life of joy, not a life of restriction. And those are garments worn by the person who has been changed by Jesus. And this brings us to our second observation. Not only that he has chosen us and we enjoy the favor with God, but because he's changed us, we love, we love the people of God. Paul's clearly talking about the unity of the church. You know, before I was a Christian and I went by a church building, it was just a building that had this, this pointed thing at the top called a steeple. I didn't even know what the name of it was. You know, when I was a lost person, I just knew the church represented something, but I didn't understand what it was until I became a part of the church, and then I looked around and I started loving these people. The people that I didn't have any idea who they were, their names, didn't know where they lived, I didn't know their background, but because I received Christ inside that body of people called the church, I began to love them. And that happened to you. Wherever you were, you began to love the church because you, you began to love the people of God and we're talking about harmony. We're talking about the togetherness. We're talking about existing with those who really love the Lord and among the peoples whom the Holy Spirit is living among them and in them and through them. And we identify together. That's why we're called brothers and sisters. That's why we're called a family of God. That's why when someone hurts and we hear, oh, someone had a terrible accident, our heart breaks. Or if someone dies, we grieve. We feel the pain because we love the people of God. And it hurts our heart because we identified with that group of people. Because we all are in the same boat of putting, that God has restored and we take off, so to speak, the old man. As he's taking that off, we put on the new man. And we must put on every day the garments that represent him. Verse 14 sums it up in the preceding characteristics should all be seen in the light of God's command so that you and I have we command to love one another. And remember that love is the sash. 
Love is the belt that binds all these garments together. So let's talk about some f- five garments that are mentioned in, first, in, in the Colossians chapter 3. First of all is the garment of heartfelt compassion. So it's the garment that you and I to put on. This is mercy. <clears throat> this is sympathy. This is where Christians are a part of the same family and we should not be indifferent to one another or cruel or harsh or impatient or all those things. But in other words, we're to be genuine. We're to possess a care. We're to possess a compassion. We care for the whole being of that person. We care for this this sister of ours. We care for this brother of ours. We care for this family. There is there this is nothing less than the feeling toward others as God feels toward us, and we are loved by God, therefore we love others around us. And so, therefore it is a heartfelt compassion. You understand what the Greek under, the Greek word for compassion is, the meaning of it? It means to be so stirred, so steered, stirred within you, all the way down to the lowest parts of your being. And according to Hebrew and Greek thought, it is the lowest part of your intestines. So now I don't mean to be gross here, but it is being so stirred for compassion through the deepest part of our being, that it causes us to respond because we care that much, all the way down to the lowest part of our bowels, that we're stirred deep within. That's why when when someone hurts, you can't sleep. That's why when someone needs help, you've got to help them. That's why when someone calls your name, you've got to respond because the compassion of God within you causes you to reach out in care and you put that care in action. And it's through the heartfelt compassion. The second garment is we're to put on kindness. This is the sweetness of disposition. It's translated the generosity of goodness. A person who is kind has good things to say about others, is considered the feelings of others. Their words are tempered with grace and tenderness. A kind person is not abrupt, it's not harsh, but yet soft-hearted, genuinely cares about others. And I know we've all understand this phrase or statement. We meet someone and you say, you know, that person is so kind. You ever said that about someone? And you think, why can't I be? (laughs) We can and we must work at that, and we, we begin to, to, to <clears throat> put on that garment of kindness, and we begin to pray about it, and we begin to seek it, and we, because God is the epitome of kindness. He is the epitome of compassion, heartfelt compassion and kindness, and we're created in His image. We're restored by Him, so therefore that garment is within us already. We just got to practice it and put on that garment. Every one of us knows Someone like this, someone whose manner and smile communicates kindness. This too is evident of the Holy Spirit living inside the believer. So we're told to put on the heartfelt compassion, the garment of kindness. And third of all, we're to put on the garment of humility. This means that we're to submit ourselves to one another. Putting the other person before ourselves to have the proper estimation of ourselves. This means to be lowly. In God's economy, it is the lowly that are exalted and the proud that are brought down. And if Jesus humbled himself even to the death on the cross, we too must humble ourselves every day. We live in a world where we're constantly bombarded to promote ourselves, to climb the corporate ladder, or to do more for yourself. Think about number one. We're bombarded with that every day. We see it. We're trying to one-up the next guy. But the pride is easily wounded. And in this crazy society, people even shoot one another if you get them mad on the highway anymore. The Christian should never possess this type of attitude. It's interesting to me how we come to understand our own sin of our life, and yet in many Christian circles, the sins of the heart, the sins of pride, the arrogance, the anger, the envy, the hatred, the the mean-spiritedness, They're tolerated in our world today, but yet we understand self-promotion and humility, uh, the conflict one another. 
And yet the well-adjusted person in the church understands that, that pride and putting ourselves number one only creates division and, and creates discord. Humility enables us to be servants. And yet humility helps us to understand and insist that others do not serve us. We serve them. Remember that God is always more concerned about the condition of the heart, for it is the heart that determines the actions, and is the heart that determines the course of our lives. And so we put on this garment of humility. The fifth garment is that of meekness. We're to put on the garment of meekness. It is the willingness to suffer injury instead of inflicting it. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength. Jesus was meek, and I would never call Jesus weak. Meekness from a biblical perspective is strength under control. And yet it takes greater strength to exhibit meekness than to burst forth with anger and to lose control. It's almost as if you and I put on the garment that keeps us bound to the, to the restrict nature of who we belong to. And it's out of gladness that we work on not blowing up out of control, but being meek in the process. Number five is, to, is that we must clothe ourselves with patience. This is long-suffering, especially in the face of injury and insult. It is marked by the ability to respond in love when others treat us poorly. It's taking a deep breath. Some, you know, years ago, if someone pointed their finger at me, I'm going to point it back. They push my button, I'm going to push it back. Now, I would rather just walk away. If they push my button, I'll just giggle like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know. And we must clothe ourselves with patience. William Barclay says this, This is the spirit which never loses its patience with fellow man. Their foolishness and their unteachability never drive to cynicism or despair. Their insults and their ill treatment never drive us to bitterness or wrath. It is the control under the midst of pressure. Patience is our own strength. In our own strength, should I say, is impossible. But patience in God's strength is possible. Patience is not something the world teaches us and practices every day. Just drive slow on the highway. Beep, beep, bump, bump, beep, beep, bump, bump. In fact, while the world may give lip service to these characteristics and yet patronize it in some way, we look to these traits to ascribe who we belong to. We look to these traits of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We look to these not, be, not, not as things we're scared of, but we're proud of, and we're encouraged to be a part of, to put on these garments every day, because we know when we put on those garments, we're representing someone beyond ourselves who's restored us, who's changed us, who's put us in his likeness, and we represent the characteristic of heaven when you put on those garments. So the question is, will we give in to the worldly pressures and act like the world, the system of the world? Or will we allow Christ to control our lives and to live according to the mandate and the precepts and the principles regardless of what others think of us? Because when we put on these traits, there are two things that are produced when these five traits are a part of our life based on Colossians 12 through 17. And it says here that accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against the other. So one of those areas, the traits that produce something in our life when we put on those garments, it produces forbearance for one another. This means to put up with and tolerate one another. It means that we can endure to have, have you ever known people you simply had to endure in life? Yes, we all experience that. But being around them may not necessarily be the funnest thing, if that's the word uh, that we can do, but we realize that in, in what we're doing for someone, there comes joy, there comes pleasure, because we're not just tolerating them, we have the patience to endure with them, and we're ministering to them, we're helping them, we're coaching them, we're guiding them through the process of our everyday example. There can never be unity in the church unless we're willing to tolerate one another. 
And the only way we can do this is through forgiveness. I forgive you. I'm, and I, to the point where I'm, I want to forget why I even had to forgive you. So we get to that forgettability moment of our life. So this leads us to the second that produces not only forbearance of one another, but forgiveness of another. Forgive one another. You know, the hardest thing in life, I thought, was standing up before a person or a family or a group of people and say, I have made a mistake. Please forgive me. But I find it harder when someone has injured just me personally, and they look at me and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? That's the hardest part of saying to them, I forgive you. Why? Because I've clothed myself with the right garments that will permit me to do this. Even though the old man within me says, don't give you a break, the new man within me says, God loves you, and he loves you more than what you could ever imagine, and therefore I love you as well because God is within me, and I'll be glad to forgive you. To forgive someone involves three things. It means we must forego the right moment to strike back. <laughs> we, must, we must forego that, and we must forget about striking back. The second thing it means to replace the feelings of resentment and anger and allow the goodwill, the love that seeks the other's welfare be more important and not harm. And third, it means that the forgiving person takes steps to restore good relationships with that person. Forgiveness can wear you out. Forgiveness doesn't just mean I forgive you. It means that I forgive you and I'm going to prove it. And it's going to be to the point of, of the goal is to restore us back to the relationship we once were. And it may take a lifetime. It may take a lot of sleepless nights. It may take a lot of patience. It may take a lot of compassion. It may take a lot of clothing. You may want to dress like you're in the summer, but you got to dress for the winter because you got to put all the garments on together. For the Christian, forgiveness may not be easy, but it's not, you know, it's not, uh, you and I can't choose not to. It's not optional. That's the word I was looking for. It, it's, forgiveness is not easy, but it's not optional either. It's essential. It's the essential characteristic of the transformed life that God has done. Forbearance and forgiveness are never a problem when we're talking about people we really love. Because he restores us to fellowship with him, we love the people of God even as he loves them. And so when we begin to see everyone around us as a people of God, a child of God, a son and daughter of God, the family of God, it changes our perspective. I don't know about you, but my dad was very strict. And when I did something wrong against my brother or my sister, I not only had to answer to my brother and sister, but I was going to eventually have to answer to my dad. And he always got home around 5.30. So if mom says, well, you wait, I tell your father when he comes home, I'm thinking, Oof, please don't, mom, because I know what was going to happen. I was going to be spanked or I was going to be disciplined in some form or fashion or maybe not allowed to play in the baseball game that afternoon or not allowed to play on Saturday with the boys in the, in the community. Something was going to come down the pipe that was going to change it. So, you know, but when I began to look at everyone, everyone in my family around me, that they belong to a family, that, that, that my brother is loved by my father, my sister is loved by my father, I'm loved by my father, and we're all, all together sharing the equal love. So therefore, when I look at my brother and I was going to do something against him, I'm actually doing it against the love of my father. So when we began to look out into the community of Christian family, and if I'm going to do something against one member of the family, I'm actually doing it against who owns the family, who loves the family, and that's the father. It changes the perspective because not only am I injuring that person, I'm injuring the father above. And so forbearance and forgiveness are never the problem when we're talking about the people who love one another. 
All right, understanding this, understanding, remember, we're talking about the areas of restoration because he chose us, we're able to enjoy favor. Uh, you know, he's, he's put us to the point where we love people. And let's get back to those other three areas of restoration. I said there were five of them. Number three, because he's called us, we participate in the peace of God. Because he's called us, in verse 15, we participate in the peace of God and let the peace of the Messiah to which you were also called in one body, control your hearts. Let the peace of God control your life. The word called means to be summoned, to be called by your name, as if you have been summoned to the court or to the table of the king. And so we're all called to the throne of God. And the imagery here is God's called us out of the world to live in his eternal presence. And in this eternal presence, there is peace. And in our everyday presence, there is peace. There is no fighting between the people of God. So we participate in the peace of God. I think that this could make the greatest difference in my life and your life. If we as Christians could simply picture ourselves in the presence of God where His holiness, His might, His splendor, His glory were always on display and there would never be any lack of unity or peace among them. And if we break into that and we, we injure someone else in the family of God, we're actually injuring the holiness, the mightiness, the splendor, and the glory of God. We're spearing it with hatred. So that's why he says it's important to put on the garments, understanding for forbearance and forgiveness so that we can participate in the peace of God in everyday life. What Paul is saying here is the peace of God should govern our hearts. It should control our lives. It should be the power of our hearts to the end that, that we are one as a body. Don't misunderstand me. There is a right way and a wrong way to have peace. The wrong way is to compromise truth for the sake of unity. Oh, I'll just go along with it instead of causing a rift to allow the devil to get a foothold. The right way is by speaking the truth in love and forgiving as we do and helping the person go beyond where they are to where they need to be. But because we're called and summoned into his presence, we are allowed his peace to arbitrate all the dealings with one another. That's why some things today don't bother you. Ten years ago, it drove you crazy. But today, it controls you. You're able to deal with that in a gracious, powerful way than you ever could in your life before because you're participating in this peace, and that peace is beginning to control you. You're summoned unto that peaceable spirit within you. Fourth is because he counsels us, we build up the family of God. There is so much we can say about the Word of God, about His promises, His powers, prophecies, and etc. The principles, the priorities. But the context of what Paul says here is the instructive nature of the Word of God as we meditate it, meditate upon it. We, we digest it or we ingest it as a spiritual food. He's talking about the fruit that was born from instruction. We're talking about the richness of his word. We're talking about the fruit that bears in our lives. And that fruit helps us to build each other up. It teaches us. It instructs us. It, it, it admonishes us. The truth here is that we are one's keepers. We are accountable to God for one another, particularly in the local church. You see, in wisdom, we're to teach and demonish one another, and teaching is the positive side of the coin. It's where we positively instruct one another, where we share insights, we share truths, we share wisdom with one another. In Sunday school this morning, we were sharing about being saved. It excites us all in that room when we begin to share about our salvation experience because unlike our lives, we're all different. There's one thing we have that's the same, and we're all saved by the same sameness of God and God restores us and it brings excitement and that instruction uh, in teaching whelps up within us and therefore these insights this truth this wisdom that we have amongst one another can help us to build up the family 
that we identify with called the family of God. Admonition, on the other hand, can be negative. It's the, the side of the coin that means to warn or to caution. To go to someone, don't do that. I see that in your life. Don't do that. It's only going to harm your situation. It's only going to harm your marriage. It's going to harm your children. It's going to think about this before you do it. It's the admonition that says, I'm giving you the warning because I care and I love you and I want to see you not have to stand before anyone and say, sorry, I made a mistake. Let's ward it off before the mistake happens. And we help one another and coach one another along to counsel one another, to teach one another, to admonish one another. And this is to be done in the attitude of praise, the attitude of worship, as we give God thanks for all that he's done. This is fascinatingly insightful when you and I understand our responsibility of building one another up. What the Scripture is teaching us is that our attitude should be one of praise and worship and gratitude and thanksgiving because what we do, we're doing it for God's glory, for His honor, and He receives the praise. He receives the glory. He receives everything that's due His name. When someone says, thanks be unto God, I am restored. Thanks be unto God, I have been helped. Thanks be unto God that I was, I was helped to not make that mistake. Thanks be unto God that I am what I am because someone cared about me. And last of all, and fifth, because he cares for us. Now, this is probably, if we could reverse it in priority order, I'd put this as number one, but I couldn't change the scripture. And number five is we cherish the name of God. This is where we park. This is where we plant ourselves. This is where we gain insight. This is why we clothe ourselves with garments. This is why we get to the point where we submit. This is why we yield. This is why we give our life to God every day. This is why we live in his presence. This is why we give God thanks because we cherish the name of God. Our gratitude calls us to be careful about how we carry the name of God every day. It causes us to be mindful of the fact that we're called Christians, that we belong to that. It is a privilege, it is an honor, and it is a joy. We belong to the King of kings and the kingdom that is, that is with no end. We belong to the eternal factor of which our lives are built upon here on earth in a temporal standpoint. We belong to the God who is created. We are the God, we belong to the God who still creates. We belong to the God who saves, and we belong to the God who, who restores, who forgives, who puts us back in position to serve him. And our gratitude should cause us to carry that name of Christ everywhere we go. We cherish God, and we cherish his name. This means that we do something in the name of Christ. We do it on his behalf. It is under his authority and is under his rule. There are many times, I guess, the pride within me wants others to know a little bit about what I do. But the older I get, I don't care what what others know I do. I just do it. Ten years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, let me kind of outline. I remember when I first became a pastor, each week I almost felt like I had to have an accountability to let the church know that I have visited a certain amount of people or I have done this certain amount of things so that I can, could have the, the right to be their pastor. But it's not about that. It's about the cherishing of the name of God. It's recognizing the fact that what I do and who I am is based on the name of God. It is based on Him being Lord of my life. It is based on Him being controlling of my life. We cherish the name of God in everything we do. And when that happens, it'll be a whole lot easier to understand compassion. When that happens, we'll understand kindness. We'll understand humility. We'll understand meekness. We'll understand patience. It'll be so much easier to forbear with one another, to tolerate one another, and to forgive one another. It'll help us to understand the peace of God is that controlling factor. It helps us to understand the joy of being a part of the family of God. It helps us to understand that peace is what governs our life because we cherish the name of God. And in verse 17, for whatever you do in word and in do, deed, Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.
So he concludes this passage about Jesus and his name. Is that wonderful change in your life evident? We sing it occasionally since Jesus has come into our heart. And has that change evident in your life and in my life? I'm asking the question of myself as I'm asking you. Has his light filled the darkness of your soul? How has it changed the way you treat fellow Christians? Has his presence given you the ability to forbear, to forgive, to love others more than you love yourself? What change has been wrought in your life? Or if you don't like that word, brought in your life. Has your life ever been restored? If not, why not today? How does that happen, Pastor? You know, I think it's simple. We make it complicated. I think it's simple. Lord, change me. Forgive me. I am a sinner in need of a sinless God to change me, save me, heal me. Years ago, one of the members, first pastor, pastor that I had, I was preaching the invitation, and at that time, I judged the success of the sermon by the amount of people who came down the aisle. Remember those days, Scott? <laughs> and we'd make that judgment. And one of the gentlemen in the service says, Pastor, if you could explain to me why an invitation is necessary, I'll join the church next Sunday. Big deal. It wasn't the joining of the church that I really needed. I wanted to know he was saved. I said, okay, I'll get back with you by next Sunday. And so I began to research the power of an invitation. You know where it began? The seat of sinners. They put a seat out front, and the pastor would say, Now you who are sinners, come sit in this seat. As we pray over your confession, your sin, so that you could live life. That was the invitation. So you can imagine if the pastor pointed, <laughs> you wanted the duck, because he may be calling you to the seat of sinners. And so I presented that back to him. He said, well, that doesn't explain to me why it's necessary. I said, oh, yes, it does. Marvin, it does. Because when you understand what this invitation is about, you'll understand the necessity of giving your life to Jesus. You'll understand the importance of saying to God, I am a sinner in need of salvation. And so the invitation is not about walking down an aisle. The invitation is about everyday life. When we confront someone, we care about someone, we love someone, we say to them, I love you because I want to see you have what I have. I care for you. I have compassion for you. I want to help you to be where I am today to understand God, to understand his love, to do everything in his name, to cherish his name, to worship his name. But it comes by saying to God, here am I, a sinner. Change me. So if you want that restoration, it's for you today. Change me. I am in need of God. Father God, we thank you that you grace us with your presence in such a way that reminds us of your love and your care, and yet the importance of being connected to you can never be minimized, and yet it should be elevated amongst all others. Connected as a true vine, the branch to the true vine, realizing that we as branches have no, no way to live without the nutrients of the preciousness and the power of the source, and that's the vine. Lord God, help us to connect our lives today. For those who know you, to be further connected. To those who don't know you, to connect and understand Jesus as Lord of their life. 
We thank you for what you're doing in the midst of all of us this very day to encourage us and strengthen us, to charge us to live a life that is honorable to you. But we realize that even this sermon is not about us, it's about you, and it's about the glory of who you are. We give you thanks, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In your name that we pray, amen. My friend, our our song of invitation is His Name is Wonderful. Whatever better song to sing that His Name is Wonderful, beautiful chorus has been around for years upon years. And may we sing that believing that His Name is Wonderful today. So let's stand together. Let's sing. His Name is Wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful jesus my lord he is the mighty king master of everything his name is wonderful jesus The rock of all ages, almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Oh,